Hello, everybody. We are back with Work at Life. Um, I am Maddie Grant. I am a culture designer at Propel, and I'm here with my good friend, Sonia. Uh, Sonia, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Sonia Lacina. I am an organizational psychologist at Question Pro. Yes. And so um, if you have been listening to our podcast for a while, you know that work at life is all about that gray area between work and life. Um, and in this particular season, we have been talking about the great, um, the first female recession um, as our big sort of theme for season two of the work at life podcast. So for today, we wanted to um, basically just summarize the last few episodes and the different guests that we had on the show um, and kind of wrap it up for our last episode of this season um, because we're going to take a little break after this and come back um, bright and early in September, probably with uh, our new our new season. So um, I wanted to just go ahead and, and kind of give a quick recap of what we've been talking about for the last few episodes. So on um, the very first episode, we we discussed the concept of the first female recession. Um, and our big surprise, because as you know, we always start every episode um, or include in every episode a data point um, to talk about. And we were really surprised in the first episode to see that people aren't really aware of what the first female recession is and how bad it is. Um, and essentially 2.3 million women compared to 1.8 million men in the US left the workforce last year. Um, and 86% of job losses were incurred by women. So, you know, obviously the pandemic has been really bad for everybody, but worse for women, hence the first female recession. Um, and also the pandemic in one year um, has set us back significantly from the baby steps that we had been making before to get women you know, up to the same level um, as men in the workplace. So kind of depressing <laughs> to start off the season. Yeah, um, and that's, it. and the one thing is there, there's so many big things in the world to, to have an impact on and things that are not easy to change. And so for us, you know, after we were reading the headlines and seeing information about the first female recession, even for Maddie and I, who are so ingrained in culture and so ingrained in diversity issues. Um, it was something that we wanted to really help give a spotlight to, because I, I think most people, most people in general, are probably no strangers to knowing that women are generally paid less than men. They hold fewer executive mm -hmm. positions, even oftentimes fewer management positions. But it was important to us to really, again, amplify um, the tough news that women got hit really hard during this time because, again, a lot of people I think knew, especially in organizations, how hard we had to work and how strategic we had to be to give women the right opportunities and and give them more visibility and give them equal pay, et cetera. Uh, but it was important to know that that battle was actually going to get even more difficult because of this pandemic. And so, um, again, to reiterate what Maddie said to us, it was maybe a little it was surprising that that was a lot less common knowledge. And there are a lot of people who can make a difference in that area. And so um, we created the, the sequence and the season to really highlight the different action items that people could take, especially those who are, you know, leaders in culture and leaders in human resources, et cetera. Um, but also really anybody can make a difference, I think, in that area, whether you're a hiring manager, whether you're a spouse supporting somebody, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as a, as a, culture designer, um, I feel very strongly that if you name the the problem, if you name the issue, then that is a big step towards solving it. So so just being able to talk about this and share, you know, with, with our audience, share with more people that this, um, you know, first female recession exists at all, I think is actually really important in, you know, helping to take, you know, new baby steps towards helping to fix the things. 
Um, so in the conversations that we had this season, we had several really interesting guests. And I think really for each one, we found some silver linings. So in episode two, we talked to Megan Newhouse, and we heard her story about reflecting on her own life and um, honestly, her own downward spiral that led to her reinventing herself, um, which seems a little off topic, except the idea that the pandemic forced everybody to a greater or lesser extent to really truly think about what matters to them in their personal lives and how much um, the personal and the work like mesh together once, you know, everybody's at home on zoom trying to do business meetings and they have their kids in the background. They have the, the dog who wants to be walked, you know, they're possibly um, dealing with people who are ill. You know, there's so much like mushing together, you know, even more than before. Um so this concept of um, really taking the time to truly think about what's important in your own life um, as relates to, you know, what we would have traditionally called work-life balance, but it's even deeper than that, right? Um, and then beyond that, um, how organizations have started to provide access to services that can help like mental health services, or just really paying attention to how they can support their employees, like just asking, like, how are you doing? Um, you know, and that's, that should be important no matter what, right? And I think wellness is something that's been um, in the kind of lexicon for organizations for a while. But the pandemic put into relief, you know, how how important it really, really is. And for organizations, how important it is to actually support your employees. Like it's no longer something that's just a checking the box or compartmentalizing or a perk. It's actually really core. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually had a, a personal moment with that recently as um, when the pandemic, I'm, I'm always very good staying on top of my mental, my mental, my medical checkups, mental will come next. Um, <laughs> and during the pandemic, that became a challenge because for a while vaccines were not available. And so I wasn't going to my routine checkups. And now that I was able to get vaccinated, I already went to the dentist, I got my blood work done. And one of the things that you know I was saying I need to prioritize for myself is my mental wellness plan because it was such a challenging year and a half. And I've spoken with so many people that have gone through different things. And I've personally gone through moments of, I feel so fortunate of moments of can't take this anymore. Um, that I thought it's something that I want to be as I'm going back to all of my routine checkups for my physical health, that it's an opportunity to really uh, put mental health on par. And I hope again, uh, Maddie, to your point earlier, it's naming things, talking about things. I hope, a lot of people do that as well. Like for people who have kids, kids are going back to school. For people who don't fall, I think in some ways is also is viewed as a new beginning. Summer's ending, you're you know refocusing on different things. And so, um, mm -hmm. I would make a personal plea to those of you who are listening that you know while you're continue to take care of yourself, do take mental health very seriously. I, I do think that it's something that's fortunately become less taboo, but I think it's also um, an area that more people have an opportunity to really dedicate time to. And I think it's, it's going to be so incredibly helpful. So I made the commitment to myself that I, as I return to my overall well-being and, and focusing on that, that that will definitely be a significant area of focus for myself as well. Yeah, we need to normalize it even more. So it's yeah. definitely started, but we have so much more we can do on that front. Um, so... Then in episode three, we turned our focus to working parents. So as Sonia just mentioned, um, and we had a great conversation with Kelly Schwind Wilson, who is an associate professor of management at Purdue University. And she shared some fascinating statistics about the difference in the perception of managers about how supportive they are being or how supportive they're being versus um, how much employees feel supported. So it's like the perception between the manager and the employee. Um, and specifically how this relates to the return to the workplace. 
uh, one thing we talk about a lot in our culture work is how you need to design the organization around the needs of the employees. Um, and I think pre-pandemic, that was a pretty abstract concept. Like, why would you do that? No, you need to, you know, create all your programs and products and services for your customers, right? But in actual fact, the you get better work out of your employees if you design your workplace in such a way that they can work um, most effectively, you know, for them individually. Um, and the pandemic, again, just put that in huge relief in the sense that, you know, now we're talking about how different people need different kinds of flexibility, right? So it's not, it's no longer a one size fits all or a certain level in the hierarchy are the ones that get the corner office. <laughs> you know, now it's like some people work better at home. Some people work better in the office. Some meetings are better over Zoom. Some are better in the office. You know, there's all these different things. And then from related to the to Kelly's um, research, um, there's just the idea that the, that in management, you often have, and this is true of senior leaders as well, you often have a, a more positive <laughs> perception of the workplace and or of your own um, sort of abilities in the workplace than perhaps your employees do. And so, you know, what do we do with that kind of disconnect? Yeah. And one thing I've actually been thinking about a lot lately too, the kind of the ties, the episode with Kelly and Megan is um, that hopefully a lot of kids will go back to school full time. We'll, we'll see how that shakes out. But I haven't done research around this personally, but anecdotally speaking with a lot of friends on, on various continents that have kids of different ages, they've actually said how impacted their kids are by the pandemic, whether it's social interactions, whether it was missing some developmental milestones, like actually starting school for the first time in person. Um, and I think that they're they were just saying how much of a difference they saw in their kids. It, it, again, it was across ages, across different countries. Um, mm -hmm. My son is really small. So I, I see some maybe differences in him, but it's, he's not able to maybe verbalize things as much as possible. And so um, Maddie, as you, as you were talking about the support for parents and the different shifts, again, I couldn't help but think that sometimes for, for people, for organizations, when it's something that's like physically visible, it's easier to address like, oh, my child can't go to school, they need to be physically at home with Zoom. So I need more flexibility. Um, one thing that I think organizations and managers can be really in tune to is the kind of maybe mental support the parents will also need to give to their kids, even if they've been able to return. How effective are they in class? How are they interacting with their peers? How well are they consuming knowledge? Um, are there any developmental gaps or just learning gaps from how education happened last year? I think it's going to be a lot more delicate. It's, I think it's going to be a lot less obvious, but I think in some ways it might even be even more important than what happened last year. Again, because it's not visible, but because it's in such yeah. an important part of kids' lives that are going to impact their parents. So um, we'll see how that evolves. But just as you were talking and just kind of popped in my mind, and I was like, oh, I, I think this is like the next stage that we just need to be, um, again, hoping the pandemic in some ways, you know, we're able to contain it and able to resume our physical lives in some ways, just for us to not forget and think like it's behind us. Um, the support, you know, doesn't need to be there as much. I think it's going to need to be there and maybe just in a very different form. Yeah, I think we just need to be hyper aware of mm -hmm. all of these things. And, you know, you mentioned, Sonia, your your son is really small, two years old. And mm -hmm. I have two kids that are teenagers and one is going to college in the fall. And so they were they actually handled everything great. They actually mm -hmm. really quite enjoyed, you know, their Zoom classes. But we don't know. I don't know what it's going to be like for them you know, next year, like having had this full year, I mean, my son, you know, had his senior year in high school at home. Oh, he missed out oh, on I... all the senior year stuff you're supposed to do. No. And of course he, doesn't, he doesn't know what he's missing, right? Like, yeah. he didn't, so I was the one that was kind of sad about it. 
Yeah, because you know the milestones. You live yeah. that. You love that. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, he he's with a whole generation, a whole year, same year, freshman, you know, year in college of kids who were basically have this kind of weird missing year in their yeah. in their school history. So yeah, I I would not be surprised if that comes out in in different ways that we don't even know about yeah. you know, future yeah. future years. Um, so, and then it, what's interesting is, so this is a perfect segue to the, the summary of episode four, because in that one, we talked to Dan Riley, who is a self-proclaimed optimist, like both of us. <laughs> um, and in that great conversation, we talked about new qualities of leadership. And based on our data points, um, we want thoughtful, caring, decisive, and empathetic leaders. So it's exactly what we're saying, like leaders who can who can have this awareness of these other things that are going on in our lives um, and who, who not only listen out and look out for signs of, you know, support being needed, for example, but actually proactively, you know, ask the question, you know, how are you doing? Um, and it was really interesting in this conversation to hear about how, these qualities of empathy and caring were much stronger percentages than they had traditionally been in the past. And we talked about how those qualities are, are associated. Of course, this is not a blanket truth, but they're associated more with women with female qualities, you know, soft skills, which I hate that term, but there's no, better one yet I can think of Um, and you know traditionally and so you know us being optimists of course we were like well you know how can these you know if these are qualities that we want in leaders you know could that be good for helping to combat this first female recession in the sense that maybe there there might open up more leadership opportunities for women um if an organization is smart enough to realize that they need people like that who can have these these qualities. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where I think for, for that episode, we gave it the, the bold title of Igniting the Rise of the Female Leader, because again, if we can influence the narrative, I would love to see that. I would love to see it more than just, ah, you know, we're inching women back to where they were before <laughs> the the yeah. pandemic, which wasn't a great place to really like, how can we take this and really catapult it? And, and to me, what was encouraging and in, in the research we did around that is when when we asked people to look at the traits and say, do you, you know, imagine a women, a female or a male leader, when you look at these, it was split. And we know that, that there's not an even 50-50 split at top of organizations today. Uh, but that didn't hinder people from actually saying, ah, you know, yes, I do relate these to women as much as I do to men. And I, I see women in these kinds of positions. So hopefully, again, the more we can talk about both, the more we can help with changing of the perceptions, opening the opportunities, and again, really helping helping write the narrative for how, how organizations can really start to equal out the, the genders, and the, especially in top leadership. Yeah, and we know how, I mean, there's been a ton written about that, that the gender differences and, you know, how women need to be more like men to get ahead, mm. you know, all of that. But at the same time, they're, um, they can be hurt by those qualities. You know, if they're, if they're too ambitious yeah. and too aggressive and too whatever, you know, it's bad, but in a man, it's, these are good qualities. Like all of that kind of um, narrative, as you said, is, is already there. So, you know, I felt really good about the idea that they're, yeah maybe we're taking a slightly bigger than baby step here. Yeah. (laughs) With that one. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And then, so um, in our last most recent episode, um, we spoke with Yasenka Sabanovich um, about limiting beliefs and your inner critic, which is of course, totally related to this idea of, you know, female, um, female leaders. Um, And because, you know, as women, we definitely have an inner critic who tells us we're not good enough. 
Mm-hmm. And I think we actually had a, a, a conversation in one of our early podcasts um, about that and the imposter syndrome and, you know, how yeah. like, we, we never feel like we really deserve to be in the leadership positions that we are. Um, so, yes, I got some really great advice around all of that. Um, and just the idea that, you know, we need to not be afraid to speak up, to take risks and to follow our intuition, you know, because we, yeah. we do have strong, good intuition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love the the advice too, to as much as we have the inner critic to look for the inner nurture as well and take care of ourselves and <laughs> really look for, for all the good. So yeah, I think that was a nice, nice way to wrap up um, with our guests. <laughs> so many different perspectives and, and different topics. And yeah. I think how, how women can help themselves um, at this point, you know, hopefully come out of this in a, in a much better place. Well, and I think that's exactly the point of this whole season is that, you know, because we always want to balance what the individual can do compared with what the organization can do. Mm -hmm. Um, But that balance is really critical. We can't just sit back and wait for companies to step up and do these things for us, Mm -hmm. right? So there's definitely some individual power that we need to take back. Um, And maybe next season, we might talk more about that. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Um, Yeah. but, you know, it, there is a balance and there's also lots and lots of things that organizations can do to help support, yeah. you know, women in the workforce, specifically parents, you know, as a sort of subgroup. Um, things that, you know, they organizations and companies maybe didn't really think much about or or it was things like wellness that maybe just sat within an HR department to think about. But now there's much more of a realization that um, that, you know, if you don't pay attention to these things, you're going to lose, you know, a really significant portion of your best workers, possibly, yeah. right, um, because of the this whole first female recession. So, you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see how, how um, hopefully just temporary this was, like, hopefully like a little blip in the universe. But, yeah. you know, we're hopeful that that both sides of this coin can really take action, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I do think what you're saying, Maddie, is so important because for organizations that do something, they're much more likely to also attract individuals who are proactively doing something. Mm-hmm. And so when you have those two forces from an organizational and an individual standpoint, you're going to be in a much better place because as an organization, you'll have better people. You will, without a doubt, do better financially. And as an individual, when you have a choice, you would probably, given I don't know what other factors like could be so significant, choose to go to a place where you're going to feel really supported over somewhere where you feel like you'll have to fight on your own. Maybe if the circumstances are such that you can't find a place at the time where you'll feel supported, you'll choose the other one. But other things being relatively equal, you'll want to go somewhere where you feel like you know, the organization believes in you and wants to give you the resources to succeed. So that's where I'm hoping that to your point, again, like people realize they can take action and they can really um, carve, you know, have an influence and impact on on their future. Um, But for organizations to know that if they're not doing it, they're going to miss out on some really amazing talent. So hopefully it'll be a bit of a perfect storm seeing both of these like ends kind of rise and, and just really create um, a difference and an impact. And one data point that we prepared today um, to, you know, kind of <laughs> maybe it, it's certainly not an end to the conversation. I think this is just the beginning, but maybe yeah. um, <laughs> somewhat, <laughs> somewhat of a closing just this season is uh, Maddie and I have you know, thought so much about, again, through these different topics, how can we help? What do we raise awareness on? What brilliant people do we bring on to bring advice? And we were just thinking, you know, what makes, how do, what is our thought for really the, the end of the season? And, and one question that we asked um, of 
people in, in the US is how has the global pandemic impacted their lives? And we asked both of men and women to compare because based on the you know many statistics we share during the season, women were more heavily impacted because they had to carry more of the burden of taking care of the family and their parents, and they were more likely to step out of the workforce. But we gave this, you know, zero to 10 point scale and zero was, you know, that the pandemic was an inconvenience. 10 was that it was a life changing shift. And men and women scored very close. Men, it was a, you know, mean of 5.7. And for women, it was a mean of 6.2. And so when Maddie and I took a step back and looked at this data, we thought, you know, what, what does this mean? And and the first thought that came into both of our minds is that it, it shows resilience. It shows resilience of people in general because, man, this pandemic was definitely more than an inconvenience, I would say, to most. But you yeah. can tell people are still fighting through it. Um, and, and women only scored slightly higher than men. I, I really thought when we launched this question that we're going to see a pretty significant difference. And, you know, we'll be able to say, wow, you know, women really felt it more. But even though the statistics show that maybe the pandemic was tougher on them in many ways, I think this data point shows that fight. The idea of saying, yes, this was incredibly hard, but I'm not going to let this define me. I'm not going to let this overcome me. Um, I won't deny that it was you know, difficult, but I still want to take ownership and I, I still want to you know, have an active act in shaping my future. And so from all the things that were tough that we discussed this season and all the things that we wanted to highlight, this was definitely, I think, a, a data point of hope both for men and women, uh, particularly for women. And, you know, as the narrative, as, as we followed this, um, you know, in the media and in our conversations, one of the one of the sayings I, I, I came across was, you know, in addition to the first female recession, they were calling it a she session. And now they're talking about a she covery. <laughs> and I really hope this is it. I really hope that, you know, yeah. we're um, coming out of it will be stronger. I know we will. There's still so much more awareness to be done. There's still so many changes to be done. Um, we'll continue to talk about it, but in as, as a topic area in our podcast, we'll, we'll wrap up the season. We'll continue to share insights. We'll do some longitudinal study to see if some of these, you know, trends that we're seeing has changed. And then, um, as Maddie mentioned in the beginning, we'll be back in September. Uh, we'll announce the new topic. We we have a really strong idea in mind that we're really excited about because again, it shines all the optimism that Maddie and I continue to carry yeah. in our hearts, no matter what the world around uh, throws us and throws our way. Um, but it's just it's, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you all for joining us through this journey, through joining our guests, and uh, we absolutely cannot wait to see you again in the next season in September. Yes, absolutely. We're all survivors. And the key is just to keep these lessons, um, you know, keep them in mind, keep them top of mind for companies and organizations. And um, I can't wait to talk to you more um, about all of this stuff in just a few weeks. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, thanks, Sonia. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs>